So I needed some six millimeter bolts one night in the workshop. I did have some already, but they weren't long enough. And it was 11 o'clock at night, so there was no going to the store to get longer ones. Not that I was really eager to go anyway because of the pandemic. But as we've seen a lot on this channel, one can use basic tools to make a lot of things. Enter the Frankenbolt. It's like another 10 bucks saved for Project 600. These will work, but they're not pretty and they're not very precise. To make them pretty and precise, we'd need something like a lathe. If only. Welcome to the shop, mini lathe. While I set this up, I'll talk a little bit about the idea behind this video. There are some things I've been trying to make for a while, but I couldn't make them because I needed more precision. So I started looking into getting a metalworking lathe and mill, machines that in theory unlock the capability to make just about anything in the workshop with precision. The prevailing wisdom seems to be that folks should start with large, high-powered versions of these machines. But these are expensive, and meanwhile, they're huge, and I'm short on workshop space. So I eventually started to wonder, could the mini-sized versions of these machines be useful instead? There's a negative perception of them to some degree. This seems to boil down to the idea is that they're too small or underpowered to be useful and that they're too discouraging and difficult to get good results for newbies like me. For the record, I mentioned in my last video that I used to work in a machine shop, but I was a machine operator working with computer-controlled mills. I pressed buttons, changed inserts, and cleaned up parts. I never got to work with any manual machines like these. Anyway, if those negative perceptions were wrong, that would be great. So I looked into the question, and I developed a hypothesis. I think the mini lathe and the mill are going to be worthwhile for amateur makers in the home shop. To help me test this, I reached out to Eastwood, who recently released their take on the mini lathe and mill. They sent me these machines as part of this long-term experiment, and that means I get to start working on this sooner than I planned. That went way better than I thought it was going to. So with the setup done, I did some research to figure out what I was doing. Eastwood's lathe videos were well worth a watch. Frank Hoosie and Quinn Dunkey were also great resources. Hello internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Now it was time to start on my first experiment, making that six millimeter bolt I needed earlier. I started with some softer materials, plastic, aluminum, and brass, with the idea that those would be more forgiving while I figured out what I was doing. And then I'd move on to my final material, steel, which is hard and harder to machine, but it will ultimately be the most useful material I'd work with here, so the mini lathe needs to be able to handle it. As you can see on the aluminum one, I didn't get it quite centered in the chuck, but it still worked. You can also see a little nub in the middle of all of these, and that's because the tool is too high in the tool holder. And so as the part spins, that middle is never getting cut by the tool. If it was too low, I could shim it up, but since it's too high, I'm gonna have to basically file down that tool holder, which should be easier than shimming in theory because I can just sand and creep up on the right height. That helped. Still a little bit high. Pretty close. Well, that feels smooth. There's just the tiniest bit. I think that's close enough for this.
I realize now that I screwed up in kind of a hilarious way, or at least it seems funny at one in the morning. I didn't think about how I was gonna hold on to the work for the rest of the steps. As you can see, I, I was planning on having four and a half millimeters of material to hold on to in the chuck while I did all this wild cutting 60 millimeters out from there. And that's not gonna happen. I can pull this thing out of the chuck with my hands. So that's kind of an unexpected surprise with this process. I went into it thinking, this is kind of intimidating. Feeds and speeds and uh. Well, instead it's you did too much work up front when you should have just taken a long piece of stock and stuck it in the chuck and cut to there and then cut it to the final length at the end. Funny stuff. I got ahead of myself again here because I drilled that center hole so that I could bring the tail stock up. But when this is rotating right now, you can see it's wobbling. And so that drill wasn't in the center of the plastic. That's because I faced this and drilled that hole while this soft piece of plastic was just flying around out here in space with very little support from the chuck. So the piece deflected instead of staying centered. I can still fix this very easily. Luckily, because I didn't cut this part up before I chucked it in. Order of operations stuff here. Right in the center. Awesome. Ooh, that power feed is nice. That finish is just smooth. Essentially, it's tapered on the front and the back. I'm guessing that's because it has a lot more flex in the middle, and that might just be inevitable because it's plastic. Hi, Dad. Hi, Malcolm. Why don't you close the door and then put on your safety glasses and you can watch what I'm doing here. What you're gonna do is stand right here. Okay. And then whatever you do, keep your fingers and everything out of here because this chuck is gonna be spinning really fast. And this cutting tool is gonna move down and it's gonna shave off this plastic here. You ready? Yeah. And now we'll back it off. Just back it off me. I'm backing out the tool and now we'll check and see where we're at. Look, mama. Oh. major ridges here on 30 thou but doing a spring pass and just running the same depth again seems to help ouch that was a terrible finish I used to think of oil as a thing to just lubricate the cut, but in this case, it's also really trapping the shavings so that they don't turn into sand and get all over everything. Well, that's cool. I mean, not very cool, but now I know that can happen. Pretty good. Got a chamfer there even on accident. Nice. Yeah, that's working. Cool. Clogging up with chips because it's the nature of this plastic, but...
say my cutting tool is screwed up. All right, let's try this again with the Eastwood one. What's going on here? Ooh, a big old chunk out. Too much of a cut, I guess. So there's a trick for parting where you can flip the tool upside down like I have here, but it's just too low. If I had an indexing tool post, I could lift it up, but I don't think I can do that unless I just shoved another piece of something underneath this, get it up higher. Yeah, I'll just, I'm just gonna do it the regular way. I'm getting paranoid because I don't want to break my tab. So you can see I've got this whole raised area that didn't cut off before it kind of split. I don't know if that's just the plastic or if that's me going too fast or what. I guess we'll find out. That worked great. Well, I've had three bolts to practice. I guess it's time to try steel. Steel is much harder than these other materials, so the lathe is gonna have a tougher time with it. But how tough of a time? I don't know. The payoff here is big, because if a newbie can make a steel bolt with this thing, then we're set. I was trying to make room for this over here, but I moved it too far back, so this started to hit over here. Okay. So my target is six millimeters, but I need to use inches because that's what the lathe measures in. My last cut, I did a 20 thou cut and it took off 43 thou. So that means that if I did another 20 thou, that would get me to 230, which is just about 228. So I'm gonna do 15 thou and creep up on this, I think. Just to explain, when I do a 20 thou cut, that's taken 20 thousandths of an inch off of each side because it's going around. 6.20. So that time it was 30 thou exactly, which is what I should have gotten. 6.05. I'm just gonna go one thou. I'm just curious what happens here. 6.10. Okay, so I got a little bit of room to use the round nose bit. I'm gonna do that. Ooh yeah, that's much better. That's very nice. But how's the diameter? 5.9, I am happy with that. Now we're getting deep into serious territory. The tap and die are made of hardened steel, which is just a hardened version of the same material we're trying to cut. So there's less room for error here and more of a likelihood that the tap or die could fail or break and screw things up. All right, very cool. Okay. 
All right then. So the tip of my parting tool broke off. I had my face shield on, I was fine. Now we'll just go cut this stuff on the band so it'll be okay. With that, there was only one step left to shape the hex head on these bolts, and I can't do that on the lathe. I could use the mill, but I wanted to see how hard this would be for folks who don't have that machine. We'll be making some soft jaws soon. Well, our bolts are finished, so let's analyze the results from our experiment. To recap, for this video, our hypothesis was the mini lathe is useful for amateur makers in the home shop. Based on the success of these bolts, I think the evidence supports that. Are you going to be making every single bolt you need with this? No. You know, it took me probably two hours per bolt, but I am green as I'll get out. And this is a pretty long bolt. That extra length adds a ton of time. This is more useful for, oh, if I just had one M6 one inch bolt to finish mounting this TV or whatever. Essentially, you make sure you have the materials on hand and the taps and dies to be able to make whatever bolt you need, and you're set. The machine had plenty of power and rigidity to handle cold rolled steel out of the box. I do see some things to do, like getting that quick change tool post and adding some carriage locks, but those were not necessary. There's the axiom that buying one of these mini lays is just like buying a kit, that you should expect to do a bunch of work on it right out of the gate. That wasn't really the case here with this Eastwood lathe, at least. It worked great. Speaking of the Eastwood side of this, I gotta mention that I wrote off the cutting tools it came with at first, but that was wrong. These worked better than the ones that I got from Harbor Freight. That rounded tip turning tool was really the only thing that I needed, and I could have used a grinder to round the tips on one of the cutting tools. For the parting tool, these things are gonna break. I don't think that's the fault of the tool, that's the fault of me. And I'm guessing that I won't be the only person snapping one of those. Maybe Eastwood will eventually sell these packs of cutting tools by themselves. And if so, I really would buy another set. As far as the newbie question goes, I was able to get really good results right out of the gate after just watching YouTube. I'm handier than the average person, that's true. But the real skills required here weren't some imaginary idea of handiness. It was really being able to follow directions, take good notes, and keep track of your results, and staying cool when things went wrong. I think this says far less about me and far more about the quality of lathe information and education on YouTube and on the internet. Even with all the problems in the world today, we are pretty lucky to be alive in this time where we've got all this information available. This is a great example of that. So in short, this thing is awesome and I can't wait to dig into more projects with it. Thanks for watching.